Thank you so much for the introduction and um, for the organizers to invite me. It's an enormous pleasure to be here. This is my first Kai play. So uh, while I'm really excited to share with you some of the research that my team and I have been doing over the past years, I'm also really looking forward to hearing from you and have a lot of um, amazing discussions about the intersection of gaming and AI here at the conference. But let's jump right in. In my day job, um, this is where I work, beautiful um, Cambridge in England. It's about 10 hours from here by train if everything goes well, um, <laughs> which it didn't. <laughs> um, and you see here um, some of my team. Unfortunately, the picture is already a little out of date, but you get a sense of the people I work with. I'm really um, grateful to the uh, fantastic collaborator that I get to work with, both uh, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge and our many external collaborators. Um, together with my collaborators, I share the belief that um, gaming and AI is a very, very exciting space to be in right now, both because games can drive um, some of the most exciting research in artificial intelligence and because we have barely scratched the surface in understanding what kinds of game experiences um, new developing AI techniques could lead to in the future. So about four years ago, when my team was still a lot smaller than this, um, deep reinforcement learning, a, a new uh, AI technique at the time, um, had just been demonstrated to be able to learn to play um, the majority of 50 Atari games at um, human or superhuman level. There was a lot of excitement about that at the time. And at the time, we were trying to understand and figure out what kind of um, video game environment could be the next um, kind of challenge and pose new and exciting challenges and drive research for years and maybe even decades to come. Now, unsurprisingly, the answer that we came up with was uh, Minecraft. But there are two reasons for why the game Minecraft is such a fantastic platform for AI research that I want to highlight here. First of all, um, let me get a sense of who uh, is familiar with Minecraft, who has heard about the game. <laughs> okay, everyone, fantastic. Who has, who has played um, the vast majority? Who has um, seen someone else play? Okay, almost everyone, fantastic. So you know what I'm talking about. Um, as you know, Minecraft is this uh, very, very popular open world game. Um, the most recent numbers, I believe, were that there are about 100 million monthly active users playing Minecraft. So this is an enormous part of um, players worldwide. Um, one thing that is so particularly appealing about Minecraft is that it's not really a single game. It's really this uh, meta game where people go and they create their own mini games, play with their friends. Um, one thing that makes this um, game so appealing for AI is this diversity. It's a platform almost where we can create um, tasks that are almost achievable by current um, AI techniques and we can build that up over time. You can plug agents into this game and they can go explore the world. Um, they can build um, whatever structure you come up with, fight zombies, um, um, uh, compete for survival, all the way up to big collaborative projects. And within Minecraft, this is not done in isolation, but rather humans and agents can collaborate. And so this is one area that I'm particularly excited about, the, the, the possibilities this platform enables for research towards agents that collaborate, communicate with others, including human players within this environment. So now to unlock Minecraft as a platform for AI research, my team released Project Malmo. This platform has been online on GitHub for the last uh, three years or so. And since then, it has been the foundation for um, not only um, three um, competitions that uh, we organized together with academic collaborators. It's been used in edu education by thousands of enthusiasts and it's been used in hundreds of research projects. So it's been really fantastic to see the enormous uptake and how this platform um, has been a basis for developed um, since we
built by new techniques such as reinforcement learning, and I'll be discussing um, or as a game concept in this work here. Diving a little deeper into the uh, game concept area, I will look at how we can explore future game concepts, even if some of the underlying technology um, doesn't exist yet. Um, and then look at how um, coming up with new games can continue to drive um, AI and re reinforcement learning research. Coming back to the AI side, I'll give a, a quick overview of uh, some of the algorithms that we have recently developed that were motivated by the needs of um, games in particular. And I will finalize with new challenges um, that are reflected by the latest competition that we're running on top of Project MAMO, which is called the Minoral Competition. All right, are you excited about this? Yes, all right, so let's jump right in. All right, to give me another quick uh, sense of what, what the audience is, who here um, has, is familiar with the concepts of reinforcement learning? That's about half. So uh, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, I'll introduce some of the concepts um, that I'll be using throughout this talk. Uh, generally, in a reinforcement learning setup, we model um, some kind of world as an environment in which um, agents interact. Um, in this uh, interaction, there are three components that are important. Um, the agent will typically have some ability to interact with the environment through actions, which afford some changes in the environment. And in response, the agents will um, observe some kind of observation about um, the current state of the environment, the state of the game world, as well as some reward signal. Um, here we'll take a very general view where the environment can include other agents. Um, and notice that uh, we haven't said anything about what the observations should look like. Um, those could be some symbolic representation of the game state. It could be pixel images, etc. cetera. Um, and very importantly, the agent has some reward signal that gives an indication of whether what it's done so far um, has, has been a good idea or not. And overall, the goal of reinforcement learning is to find a behavior um, for the agent that maximizes the reward signal that it can obtain in this environment. Now, within Project uh, Malmo, what we provide is an interface to make um, Minecraft as an environment easier to use so that um, people can go download the uh, platform and start coding up um, agents to plug into this environment. Notice that so far there's nothing very specific about reinforcement learning here. So the agent could be something that is just hard coded. Um, reinforcement learning is one possible technique that can be used in order to learn this behavior, um, but there are many other choices that could be made. Um, notice that this um, interface of interacting with the environment through actions and observations and reward is a very natural fit for a lot of game situations, for example, NPC characters within games. So this is a really good starting point for many game scenarios. To just give you a sense of what a kind of first example of an agent in this Malmo world could look like, um, here's uh, kind of the demonstration that this code can fit on a single slide. I will have code samples and a small number of equations in here, um, but with each of those, rather than, um, I, I don't want you to go through and understand all of this in its entirety, but rather I want to make a specific point with each of them. With this one, I want to make the point that getting started and having a first example of an agent um, in this uh, Minecraft world is quite straightforward. And I also want you to take away that we can here see again this interface that I just showed you. The agent is interacting with the world um, by observing rewards and observations, which can be interpreted in many different ways, and by acting in this environment. In this very simple toy example, the agent ignores all observations and rewards, and it just happily moves, turns, and jumps around. And so this is how we get a simple turning, jumping agent um, in Minecraft. Now, from the simple beginnings, so we can implement this agent in any number of ways. And I want to follow this with a classic example of a reinforcement learning agent in a slightly more complex world. Um, if you are familiar with reinforcement learning, this is an adaptation of the classic cliff walking example that is also very prominent in the uh, Bible of reinforcement learning, Sutton and Bartow reinforcement learning book. Um, and this is part of the uh, uh, material that comes with Project Malmo. So if you install the platform, this is um, part of the tutorial, so you can try this out at home. 
Now, in this environment, we imagine an agent that has uh, been placed in this uh, very tre treacherous world. Um, when the agent starts out interacting with this world, it has no understanding of its environment whatsoever. And in this particular example, we have a reinforcement learning um, agent that learns using a technique called Q-learning, which I'll explain in a few more moments. Um, and the agent observes the world in a tabular representation. So it doesn't know that there are these red things that are all that all look kind of similar to each other. It doesn't know that there's this blue thing towards the end. As the experimenter, of course, we know that we want the agent to learn to navigate to that uh, diamond in the far corner. Um, but the agent has to um, understand the environment from trial and error as it takes actions in this environment. So the key of reinforcement learning is that an agent has to learn from trial and error in a complex environment. And um, all reinforcement learning is, is a formalization of this problem where an agent needs to systematically interact with the world in order to make decisions um, in unknown, uncertain environments. Um, one technique to do this is to learn from trial and error. And as the agent starts out, we can look at what that uh, might look like. Right. So as you probably expected, without any knowledge about the environment, the agent has to navigate to all the different places in this world in order to figure out the consequences of its actions. In this case, uh, the consequences are often dying in lava. Now, how does the agent go about actually solving this or learning in this environment? Um, as I mentioned here in the simple example, we can represent the world in a tabular representation and we see a visualization of the tab, uh, of the table over here in the slide. Um, we use, or this example uses um, an approach called tabular cue learning, where the goal is for the agent to take um, a variety of actions and then work out throughout this table what the consequences of each of those actions are. Um, it cannot generalize, so that means that it has to visit each of those cells sufficiently often in order to learn about the consequences reliably. Um, what you see here is that each um, state in this world, each square, is represented as one of the table squares, and you can see each action, each of the four actions that the agent can take. The colors indicate the current estimate that the agent has about how positive or negative the consequences of taking this action in that particular state might be in the long run. And you can see here that initially the agent has a very limited view of what the world contains and what the possible consequences of his actions might be. Just to give you a quick sense of um, how the agent goes about solving this, um, it learns a um, uh, a quantity that is called the Q value, also called the state action value of each state action pair. And it does that using a technique called bootstrapping, which is briefly illustrated with the equation that you see here. The Q value is defined as the expected um, payoff or reward that an agent can expect by uh, taking a specific action in a specific state and following its policy thereafter. And a key insight that is exploited by Q-learning um, is provided by the Bellman op uh, optimality equations. And this insight is that you can take apart the expected return that starts at state uh, ST and takes act actions AT by chopping off the first um, reward that the agent would um, obtain in that infinite sequence of interactions with the environment. And so you can um, equate this long-term return with um, this chopped off immediate step return plus the remainder of this infinite sequence. So you can, um, in, in essence, if you have a good estimate of um, what the value is of the state that you visit subsequently, you can back that off. And in this way, you can bootstrap from estimates that you might already have available. <laughs> now, the fascinating thing about Q-learning um, in tabular settings that has been known for decades is that um, you can derive from this a very um, short and efficient algorithm that actually is guaranteed to converge to the optimal strategy in this particular um, tabular setting. And we can see what that looks like um, in this particular Minecraft world. After about um, 
10 minutes of uh, training, the agent um, skew values have converged by backing up to earlier estimates. And you can see that now the agent has almost entirely converged to the optimal path through this environment. Um, so in this way, you can see that um, using um, an environment like Minecraft uh, makes it more um, kind of visible. You can play around with um, what, he, what the agents actually learn, and you can get a good understanding of um, what is happening as the agent explores um, and backs up its um, understanding of the environment. Um, from these um, beginnings, you can plug the agent into a wide range of tasks, and these are code samples just shown to illustrate what kinds of things an experimenter would have to provide in order to create an environment for the agent. This is the uh, example that um, creates the uh, cliff walking task that I just showed you earlier, and I just want to highlight some of the uh, choices that the experimenter would make here. Within Malmo, the experimenter can start from any Minecraft world. In our example, we started from a flat world that was generated using a specific string, um, but it could also be a Minecraft world that the experimenter created manually by constructing buildings, etc. So you start from any Minecraft world, pick a place where to spawn the agent, um, and then you can manipulate that world by placing additional elements, for example, um, send, block, uh, send uh, blocks that um, are required by the particular experimental setup. Very importantly, we then place an agent in this environment, and here you can see that the experimenter has a lot of choice over how they present the world to the agent. Um, they can choose what observations the agent can uh, obtain, so how it observes the uh, world, and you can provide the commands that the agent has at its uh, disposal in order to interact with this world. Finally, very importantly for reinforcement learning setting, the experimenter would provide the reward structure, which essentially provides the task or the goal of what the agent should try to achieve in this environment. We can look at a similar example where instead of using tabular queue learning, we now use a deep neural network in order to learn not from a tabular representation, but from pixel images. You can see um, on this slide here that the agent observes the past four frames of um, the, its interactions or its view of the environment from a first person perspective. And you can see the learned Q values that the agent um, has uh, already estimated. You can see, for example, that in the situation that the agent is currently in, um, moving one step forward is estimated to have negative consequences, which is only fair given that the agent is standing in front of a pit of lava. Now, if we play the video, you can see how the estimates of the agent change as it navigates through this environment with the visual observations that it has, and it's uh, actually learned to navigate to this scene. Now, in contrast to the tabular example I showed earlier, the advantage of using a visual representation is, of course, that the agent can generalize to different settings, different configurations, rather than being stuck with the one very specific um, platform or environment that it's been um, trained on. And in fact, um, one of the first um, kind of uh, research explorations that we did in this space was led by my amazing intern uh, Lydia Liu in 2016. And um, she analyzed to try and understand what kinds of representations might emerge as an agent interacts with um, the lava room environment that I just showed you earlier. And it's interestingly, what she found was that the agent actually learns distinct clusters where one can be identified as the agent facing a dangerous situation. So it was very nice to see that um, natural clustering emerge from the visual representations that the agent has learned. Um, similarly, um, our former intern, Matt Monfort, um, kind of uh, tried to understand how an agent could learn to generalize to new uh, navigation tasks within the Minecraft world. In this example here, you see a variety of mazes that the agent um, can very effectively navigate. And it's important to highlight here that the agent um, has been trained on similar mazes, but it has, has never seen these particular configurations and these particular visuals um, before during training. So um, Matt was able to show very impressively that um, with deep reinforcement learning, um, agents are actually able to generalize two visually distinct environments very effectively. 
So after this first taste of um, reinforcement learning in the MAMO platform, um, I want to jump forward a bit and look at what kinds of game experiences could be enabled by new techniques such as reinforcement learning. One of the um, works that I'm particularly excited about was led by my amazing colleague uh, Anthony Diggle. Um, unfortunately, he doesn't have a picture, so we'll have to make do with um, this um, cutout here. But um, <laughs> Anthony was very um, passionate about trying to understand how reinforcement learning could be brought closer to uh, gamers. And what's the kind of closest thing you can do? Here, the idea was to use reinforcement learning itself as the game mechanic. Um, you see here what uh, looks like a relatively simple platformer game, but in contrast to the usual setup, in this particular game, the player has to train the uh, agent, here the jumping character, to navigate through um, a, a, a platform game like the one that you're seeing here. Um, in this example here, the agent is, giving, is given this goal level. It, um, they start with a uh, agent, uh, again, that has a plain, clean slate, that doesn't know anything about this world. And then the agent has to try and train this, uh, the, the human player has to try and train this agent to actually navigate this um, particular environment. And without training, this is what happens. The agent doesn't initially know what to do. And so the way the, tr the, the player would um, coach the agent is they would create little training tasks in order to teach the agent what to do. Here you see the uh, kind of environment configurator where the player would create these little training tasks. And so for example, they could create a task that teaches the agent to jump over obstacles. Um, the player would do this by placing a reward in the form of diamonds. And so as the agent uses a reinforcement learning algorithm to interact with those training examples, it would learn to associate successfully clearing the obstacle with obtaining the reward that the uh, player placed in this environment. The player can then watch the uh, agent um, uh, train to obtain this reward. And here in the visualization created by um, Anthony, you can actually see that we can visualize many rollouts of the current policy to see what proportion of the uh, um, rollouts are currently succeeding in this task. And you can see over time as the agent trains, more and more um, instances of the rollout policy are actually able to successfully um, clear the obstacles. Then if we look at the uh, training progress over time in the uh, final example, we can see that again, over time as the agent trains, more and more instances of its rollout policy are able to successfully clear, this, uh, clear these uh, obstacles. And to really turn this into a game, we need some kind of leaderboard. And these are some of the ideas uh, the team has already developed. We can look at win rate, how many instances of the agent's policy are actually able to clear the uh, level. Um, we can look at the number of um, training examples that were used and the number of diamonds used. And so then a player could be challenged to try to get the agent to learn the task with as few training um, uh, levels as possible and maybe also with as few diamonds or rewards as possible. So this is one example of what's already possible using reinforcement learning as a game mechanic um, with, uh, in, in, in gaming. But as mentioned, um, I think we have barely scratched the surface of what's possible here. And one area I'd love to explore more is to try and understand what other types of game experiences, techniques like reinforcement learning could enable in gaming. Um, another piece of work I wanted to touch on is one where we didn't explore a set of techniques that can already be, be used um, using current techniques, but rather we uh, used video games in order to ask what if questions. And this was um, work led by um, our former intern, Fraser Edison. The what, what if question that we wanted to ask here was the question of what would happen if players could interact with smart um, uh, non-player characters using natural human language. Now, unfortunately, at the time we did the study, we had one problem. We didn't have a smart AI character that could actually understand and uh, correctly interpret human natural language. 
Um, so the technique we followed is one that um, probably many of you are familiar with. We used a Wizard of Oz study setup in order to try and understand what would happen if we were actually able to achieve this. And we tried to create a scenario where we, we, we reflected where we thought um, the state of the art of um, natural language understanding would be a few years down the road in order to help us understand what should be focused on and what pitfalls um, we might run into as we create such characters. The setup we had here was that um, there was a facilitator with the participant in the room. The participant would control the player in a joint mission together with Helpbot. Um, Helpbot um, was um, set up so that the player would, um, during the experiment, believe that it was controlled by an, an AI that we had trained. Of course, after the experiment, we debriefed everyone to make sure that no one came away with the wrong impression here. Um, but we made sure that during the experiment, our players um, were convinced that they were interacting with an AI character. Under the hood, of course, there was a um, collaborator, in our case, a researcher who would control the AI character. And we um, um, aligned the interactions that the researcher had with the participant through a behavioral script where we tried to reflect what we thought a smart AI character would be able to do a couple of years down the road. In particular, our AI character would recognize objects in the world. They would um, try to help the player with mining, building, and fighting. Those were the capabilities that we, um, that we gave the researcher. We try to predict the player's intention as much as possible, and that wasn't always very easy. As <laughs> if you want to hear stories about this, I can uh, discuss those offline. Um, and we wanted to give the agent a simple ability to learn from, from players' feedback. Um, we instructed researchers to try and understand simple natural language text inputs and they could um, uh, respond to any natural language input the participant provided using confirmation um, query responses such as okay, yes, no, done, show me where, etc. Um, starting from the script, we could then study not only what the participants would ask the AI character to do, how they would interact, how they would try to teach, but we could also look at what kind of natural language the uh, participants would use as they try to interact with this AI character. I won't have time to go through all the findings some of the studies, so I refer you to, to the full study for details, but I want to highlight a few takeaways that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, here's an overview of um, some of the ways in which the uh, players try to instruct the AI character using natural language. And you can see already there's a lot of um, variety and a lot of ambiguity that um, provide interesting lessons for um, what a smart AI character of the future would have to deal with. Um, but the thing I want to highlight here is the big diversity or the difference in terms of how the language used reflects that people interact with this AI character in a very different way, um, based on very different um, understanding of what the character might be able to do and what it might be able to understand. You can see the contrast between get call, um, likely a command by someone who expects, um, maybe who is familiar with um, programming and current um, natural language interfaces and tries to uh, make a command as simple and easy to parse as possible. Um, and contrast this with um, another comment, which was, please, could you go and get some food? A very polite request in extensive form, almost like you would interact with a human player. Um, the most interesting takeaway for us was how different um, the player's expectations were as they are reflected in the natural language here. And um, what we came to understand was that the language used here conveyed very, very different um, expectations of the player in terms of the AI character's ability. We also found that the human players um, starting from that initial expectation made very little changes to their initial expectations. So we can look at this as a very kind of simplified model where the players would try a new action. They would to some degree observe what the AI character would do and um, to some degree update their mental model. However, this observation and updating of mental model was very limited. Um, the observations were partial and full of the assumptions the player already had. 
and um, updating of the player's mental model was minimal and many of the initial assumptions, good or bad, persisted. Um, this um, led us to the conclusion that the initial expectations about what such a smart AI character might be able to do um, are really, really crucial. And this is where I believe a lot more work is uh, necessary to try to understand what kinds of metaphors, what kinds of embodiments of such an AI character within a game um, might be useful for creating the right set of expectations to communicate what the current ability of such an agent is, to what degree it might be able to continue learning as it interacts with the player, um, and what capabilities might be out of scope for the current AI character. We can lean on a lot of different um, source materials in order to create those metaphors, um, starting from um, interfaces that are very code-like or maybe robotic, um, all the way up to um, embodiments in form of um, um, animals or something that looks almost like a human player, each of those will create very different um, expectations on the player side. Um, and as mentioned, I think this is a wide open area that is yet poorly understood. And as um, AI techniques progress over the coming years, we will need to have those metaphors evolve together with the capabilities of those uh, player characters. So I see this as a key role that um, could be addressed in game design, how to shape player interactions with future smart game characters. Um, moving slightly back from the player experience again to AI techniques, I want to highlight um, one more um, kind of uh, project or competition um, that we used in order to try and encourage research in the direction of more collaborative um, AI characters. This is um, work with external partners led by uh, Diego Perez Libana at uh, Queen Mary University. Um, about two years ago, for this work, we tried to understand what kinds of um, interactive tasks within the Minecraft platform might be useful for pushing state-of-the-art AI technologies towards agents that would be able to flexibly interact with a wide range of collaborators, including a wide range of um, human, human collaborators. And to be clear, these types of techniques, uh, these kinds of problems aren't fully solved. So we really see this as an open problem where we wanted to establish a set of benchmark tasks that would be able to push um, reinforcement learning or other AI techniques in the direction of enabling this kind of flexible collaboration that we envisioned here. In these collaborations, we're not looking at um, natural language communication, but rather the embodied interaction of uh, can I observe a co-player, understand what they're trying to do, and respond in an intelligent way to what they're trying to achieve. Um, just to highlight a few of the challenges, when I talk about flexible collaboration here, um, this might be that um, we're controlling this character here, which has the task to catch in this case, this uh, pig together with the collaborator. Now, in order to succeed in uh, this task, we need to get some understanding of what our collaborator is trying to do. Are they trying to help us at all? Um, are they kind of uh, following a specific strategy? For example, are they trying to uh, help us catch the pig that um, we are going for? Or are they focused on the pig that is in the far corner? So we need to be able to interpret what the other agent is doing. Um, and our um, collaborator might be following different strategies. So that is one kind of challenge in terms of flexibility. We need to be able to not only learn this task once, but be able to adapt flexibly to new opponents. In addition, we would like the agent to be able to generalize to different variations of the task. So for example, to the fact that it might be put in a new type of enclosure with a different layout, with different visual characteristics, different under different weather conditions, with different mobs or other creatures in the enclosure, and um, have it be able to adapt very flexibly to those new tasks at hand, just like, um, in the sense, a human player would but um, in, a, in, in a way that is currently beyond the state of the art of, um, um, for example, deep reinforcement learning techniques. The set of benchmark tasks that we developed here um, take the form of three types of mini games, which are all created to um, um, uh, show different challenges about these collaborative tasks with AI characters. 
The first one is the mob chase that I already mentioned, and it's an instance of a so-called social dilemma. Um, the agent would benefit from collaborating with their collaborator effectively, but if their collab collaborator is ineffective, they might um, be better off just exiting the enclosure, getting a small reward rather than wasting a lot of time trying to collaborate. Um, we are also um, using a, a so-called treasure hunt, which illustrates um, different a, asymmetric roads that the agent could take. Um, this is based on a, an, an escort mission in a game where one agent is able to pick up a treasure and deliver it to the right location. Um, it's not able, but it's not able to ex defend itself against um, skeletons or other, um, or other mobs, whereas uh, the second agent is able to fight skeletons and its task is, of course, to ensure that the carrier of the treasure is able to navigate to the goal. Um, again, this requires um, an interesting level of collaboration with different um, asymmetric roles. And finally, the third type of task um, is exploring kind of tension in the reward structure, where both agents have the goal to jointly um, recreate a structure as part of a build battle, um, but the agent that contributes more to that structure gets a higher reward. So there's a bit of a tension of jointly collaborating um, and finishing the structure versus trying to be the one who contributes most to that particular structure. For each of those mini games, there are um, many different variations that we created, and these can be expanded almost indefinitely using, for example, different mobs, different layouts, and different materials in order to make these um, instances of those mini games quite different from each other and really pushing what's possible in terms of um, reinforcement learning uh, techniques here. Um, as mentioned, these are four from Solve, but I just wanted to give you a quick sense of um, what current solutions to this look like. This is uh, the publication that was most recent about the Marlowe competition. It was published by a team of um, um, students from uh, Tsinghua University um, at uh, this year's um, conference on games, COG 2019 in London. Um, one of the authors was actually the runner-up for last year's Marlowe competition, and so it was really exciting to see how they've continued this work and developed new approaches. So far, they have developed a hierarchical approach that at runtime chooses from a set of candidate policies in order to quickly adapt to a new instance of a task um, as, as quickly as possible. Um, as mentioned, the underlying problem is far from solved, and the benchmark tasks are available online. So if this is something you're interested in, do check those out. All right, with this, we're firmly back in the games for AI kind of side of this equation. And I want to give you a quick uh, sense of what algorithmic challenges my team and I are currently investigating in order to push reinforcement learning and other AI techniques towards new types of applications or towards enabling new types of applications in the gaming space. The first one of this is um, work that will be published at NeurIPS this year, um, and it's focusing on understanding how to learn sample efficiently in a setting with continuous inputs. Now, one big challenge for a lot of the techniques that we currently um, have at our disposal is that many of those are very, very effective in the limit of near-infinite uh, compute and near-infinite data. Now, if there is a lot of data and compute available, that is fantastic because in those settings, um, techniques like deep reinforcement learning can learn almost arbitrarily good behavior policies, for example, learning long-term strategies in complex games. But on the other end of the spectrum, if there's relatively small amounts of data and relatively little compute, those um, techniques are seriously, um, are, are run into serious challenges. And we believe um, strongly that one direction in order to make those uh, techniques more generally applicable is to push towards more sample efficient techniques that can learn with smaller and smaller amounts of data um, as we might find in many real world and uh, gaming situations. 
Now, <coughs> continuous actions in this space are particularly challenging because um, there it is hard to understand how the agent should explore. For example, if I, uh, kind of in a, a racing game, if I already know what happens when I accelerate at uh, level 0.2, do I need to also really carefully model what happens at 0.22 or 0.3, or can I take a relatively big steps and only coarsely explore the reaction um, of the environment to the specific controller inputs that I use? So this is the type of challenge that was addressed in this work here, led by my colleague uh, Kamil Czerszek. Just to give you a sense of the types of problems that we're looking at here, um, the challenge that uh, Camille and the team uh, investigated here was that they found that current um, um, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning techniques for use with continuous actions were under exploring. So that means in regions where the uh, agent had very little data, as is illustrated by this, uh, this region here, they would be very conservative in a way, uh, very carefully sticking to the part of the space that they had already known and try to deviate as little as possible from that area, making the algorithm very conservative. This was needed in order to stabilize part of the optimization problem that the deep reinforcement learning algorithm is solving underneath. But it did leave a lot of money on, on the table because in those situations where there's a lot of unknowns, in theory, the agent should actually be optimistic. It should be very aggressive in exploring new parts of the space that is uh, yet unknown. Um, in this work, we were able to show that it is possible to get a more systematic um, estimate of an upper bound of the current um, estimates of the agent's Q values, as um, sketched out here. And we were able to show that by using such an upper bound for exploration, the agent can be optimistic about how, about how it explores interaction with the environment and still learn in a very stable manner. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like in terms of results, the light blue line is what we achieve here on the benchmark task for continuous actions that is used to evaluate the current state of the art approaches. And we can see that the agent is able to learn robustly and get a higher performance. What does that actually mean? Um, this is what uh, it looks like when we render the current techniques in, um, in this case, the Mujoku tasks. Uh, Mujoku is a robotics uh, platform, a virtual robotics platform, which is very often used for evaluating these types of approaches. And as I play these, I want you to well, first note that the agents walk in a very non-human way. That is expected because they're not subject to normal human physics. Um, at the same time, what's important is to see how far the agent uh, moves and how stable its gait is. And so we can see that with, uh, <laughs> with previous state-of-the-art approaches, um, the agent has learned this very conservative gait where it's moving carefully and slowly in order to not fall, but nevertheless it falls towards the end of the episode, whereas with our technique it has learned a stable gait that walks much, more, uh, much faster and is able to cover a larger distance. So this is kind of an illustration of what kinds of uh, behavior current state-of-the-art approaches are able to achieve. Um, in many gaming applications, we wouldn't kind of necessarily instrument our game um, at this very low level. Um, in this case, um, the control of 14 joints and other forces. Um, so when we um, um, interact with games at a maybe higher level of abstraction, these kinds of techniques can already learn very, very strong behavior with a relatively small number of samples. So I think this is a very promising direction for um, interaction in many video games. Um, as the second work that I want to highlight here is one that focuses on generalization. This was led by our fantastic intern Max Eagle earlier this year. And the problem that we addressed here was to try and understand how an agent could learn a behavior policy that wouldn't just work for an individual specific environment, for example, an individual level or an individual set of opponents, but rather how we could encourage agents to learn and generalize to new levels and other situations. We focused again on benchmark tasks that are already available in the community. Um, and in particular, in this first one, the multi-room task here, um, the agent interacts with a sequence of rooms. It never sees the same room twice. 
So the agent should learn um, generalizable features such as that the agent itself is represented by a triangle that needs to navigate to this uh, green block. Um, it needs to learn the mechanisms for opening doors and navigating hallways and uh, really focus on learning these general features rather than what many current techniques would do, which is just memorize a specific path to the goal. So the question here was, how can we learn those kinds of general features? Another example of a task that require another example that requires generalization is this um, coin run benchmark um, developed by um, researchers at OpenAI, which um, provides us with a series of platformer games. Again, there are hundreds of instances that are all visually distinct. There might be different um, um, opponents, different mobs, different types of obstacles in this environment. And again, the agent is tasked with learning a generalizable uh, representation. So the general skill of navigating platformer games rather than memorizing the steps to solve one specific instance of this platformer game. Again, just to give you a quick um, kind of overview of the types of techniques that we're working with here, um, in this work, we focused on so-called generalization techniques. Generalization is a very common form of technique in machine learning in order to avoid um, overfitting to a specific data set or a specific instance and to learn more general features. But what we found here is that it's really worthwhile understanding how generalization interacts with reinforcement learning algorithms in order to get reinforcement learning specific um, regularization techniques. In this particular work, we are using um, one technique called an information bottleneck, which enables agents to learn more generalizable features by having that pass through a very a, a small noisy channel. In a way, it's a compression technique that um, encourages the agent to learn a very compressed representation, which is thought to generalize better than um, the one that it would learn otherwise. And secondly, we found that being selective about um, regularization to avoid negative impact that it can have in some places on the learned policy is also worth um, trying for reinforcement learning techniques. Um, just to highlight a few key results here, with the uh, um, new proposed generalization that we introduced here, um, we are now able to obtain state-of-the-art performance on the multi-room task that I showed you earlier. In particular, when we look at one-room mazes, um, the uh, trained agent is now able to solve about 70%, whereas an approach with no regularization would only achieve uh, success on 30%, and previous um, regularization techniques would be able to solve about half of those. Um, and contrast this with um, three room mazes where none of the prior techniques were able to make any progress at all, and we are still able to solve about 15% um, of those um, multiple room mazes. This is what this looks like without regularization. As the agent has never seen any of those rooms before, it's struggling with even the simplest um, tasks as it couldn't memorize the sequence of steps that uh, navigate to the goal successfully. Um, on the other hand, um, the approach that I described here is um, still struggling with some of the larger rooms, but it is able to successfully complete many of the puzzles that we provided with. Um, finally, this is uh, the result from the platformer game that I showed earlier. Um, in this example, we can see that with previous regularization techniques, the agent can fail. Um, for example, here it's running into this um, opponent very quickly, whereas with the proposed approach, the, the agent is able to generalize better and is able to solve a much larger set of um, um, platformer levels in this particular case. The final topic I want to touch on is what's next, where are um, reinforcement learning and other AI techniques going, and how can we push them in the direction that we think um, is necessary in order to enable a new wider set of game experiences. As I already mentioned, um, the problem of sample efficient learning is a very important one. And so in this um, last work that I want to present, we um, developed a new competition, the mineral competition, which is um, intended to push research towards much more sample efficient reinforcement learning. This is work led by a team at uh, CMU and in particular Wilgus um, and his team of collaborators. Um, 
The competition started again from the question of how do we get an agent to very flexibly learn to complete tasks in this huge open-ended environment provided by Minecraft. And just to give you another sense of how vast that uh, Minecraft universe is, here we can see a partial view of the tech tree all the different materials and elements and items that an agent might be um, able to discover or encounter as it interacts with the Minecraft world. And so again, the long-standing challenge is how can we get an agent to flexibly interact with this huge variety um, of, of opportunity in Minecraft. In the competition setup, we are challenging um, participants to create an agent that can learn very rapidly with a limited number of samples and a limited amount of compute and data to complete quite a complex task in this Minecraft world, which is to obtain a single diamond. Now, this might sound relatively easy if you haven't played Minecraft much, but if you imagine that an agent starts from scratch, it has to figure out that it should get wood from trees, that it needs to construct a series of tools, that it needs to figure out how to navigate to caves, explore them, avoid lava, and finally um, find some uh, diamond ore so that it can mine a diamond. Um, you realize that this is quite a complex uh, uh, task that can take many, many thousands of interaction steps with the environment. Learning this using pure reinforcement learning from scratch would be prohibitive for the, for, for the vast majority um, of uh, researchers or um, other people on this planet. And so the question is whether we can, A, leverage the task structure that we know we have in this Minecraft environment, and secondly, whether we can use human demonstrations, so human player data at a relatively large scale in order to guide the learning by the agent so that it can finally learn the skill of how to navigate the Minecraft world and obtain diamonds. And I want to wrap things up with a short video that illustrates what the competition is all about. The competition has been running over the past summer. We're in the last stages of the first round. So if you have a last minute idea of an agent you would like to submit, I think you still have three days. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, um, the second round, the playoff round, will be starting shortly. And so it's a very exciting period. Um, if you want to know more, do follow, uh, for example, the uh, Malmo uh, platform, uh, Project Malmo um, account for information on how the competition is uh, moving forward. The results will be announced at this year's NeurIPS conference in December, and I'm really curious about what participants come up with and what this means in terms of sample-efficient reinforcement learning. So to briefly wrap up, this has been a quick whirlwind tour of um, some of the work that I'm really excited about in this space at the intersection of games and AI. We started with a quick primer of um, reinforcement learning in Project Malmo and how Project Malmo can allow us to not only learn about um, RL techniques, kind of explore what's going on as an agent is learning, but also give rise to um, very exciting research, for example, about generalization in complex visual environments. We then touched on the kinds of game experiences that reinforcement learning techniques of today can already enable, such as the um, game that I showed that uses reinforcement learning as the core game mechanic. 
Um, and I also showed how we can use um, games like uh, Minecraft in order to get a better understanding of what will eventually be needed as we push towards new types of experiences using state-of-the-art techniques. Um, in this case, in, um, with the example of using natural language interaction. We then started to move back towards the AI side, looking at how many games we created for the Marlowe um, benchmark competition can push AI techniques um, towards learning how to be more collaborative, how to flexibly interact with other agents in complex environments like the mini games that I showed. And I touched briefly on the types of algorithms that we currently develop that push the state of the art in generalization and sample efficient learning. And we just concluded with this new challenge, trying to understand how to obtain more and more sample efficient um, algorithms that learn with relatively small number of environment interactions so they can quickly and flexibly adapt to new situations, to new opponents, to new players in a game situation. And I'm really curious to see what um, the results of this competition will be. If you would like to follow up and uh, learn more or try this at home, here are a couple of resources that I recommend. Um, first of all, as mentioned, Project Malmo is online, it's open source, and here are some links to get you started, um, including to the tutorial that I just showed, um, as well as kind of opening up this box and understanding what kinds of experiences could be created um, with Project Malmo in order to test out new game experiences that use AI or other techniques um, as part of their game mechanics. To uh, kind of be kept in the loop about uh, Project Malmo, do follow the Project Malmo Twitter account um, and uh, updates, including those about the recent competition, will be provided there. If you want to learn more about reinforcement learning, I will be giving a tutorial about reinforcement learning at this year's NeurIPS conference. So this will also be uh, live streamed and publicly available online. So do follow this if you would like to learn more about those um, AI techniques. And finally, as mentioned, the mineral competition is at the end, towards the end of stage one. Um, the second round, the playoff round is about to start and results will be released at NeurIPS this December. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and very much look forward to your questions and discussion throughout the conference. Thank you so much. Let's see. Do we have a few minutes for questions? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Who wants to ask the first question? No. Yeah, now it's carrying. So is there any question here? Come on. Yeah, okay. perfect. <laughs> I don't have a background in, uh, in this field, so I, I was having a little trouble following at one point. I was wondering the, the selective injection of noise. I was wondering if you could, if you could dumb that down a little bit more for me. <laughs> Mm -hmm, sure. Um, so the key idea is that um, in reinforcement learning, you have um, a learning problem where you keep updating the agent's behavior policy. And this is different from supervised learning because a reinforcement learning agent keeps exploring the world. It keeps getting co collecting its own experience. And so there are many factors that contribute to how stable the learning problem is, um, how effective the agent can actually extract information from the data it has, and um, reasoning about how the agent should interact with the world in order to get the most useful data to continue learning. Now, in this work, we showed how um, those techniques called regularization techniques affect those different components, how the agent interacts with the world, how it collects new experience, and then how effectively it can make use of that data for learning. Um, and by teasing out those different factors, we were able to show that we should be more selective about um, how we regularize in order to make sure that that learning problem underneath is solved as effectively as possible. Um, without, um, for example, having the agent ran randomly fall into lava as it explores the environment. Does that make more sense? Mm -hmm. We had two in the back. Yeah. Um, hey, so this is really great. Um, I've used Minecraft before uh, to teach students 
um, at a summer camp called Digital Media Academy. And I was wondering if there's any plans to integrate some of this stuff um, into Microsoft Learn or uh, make code or any of the tools being used because I could see this being very useful for teaching AI to uh, younger students. Mm -hmm. um, it's not anything that we have planned at the moment, but if you have ideas of what would be useful, I'd love to catch up offline. So please do, do catch me after. Thanks. I'd love to hear more about that initiative and how you've used Minecraft as well. <laughs> Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this. It is uh, saving us a lot of work um, so. and, and make, helping us actually focus on the techniques that we want to apply. I have a lot of questions, but um, do you have any example like, that you can explain quickly about the player prediction you mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, it's that's a, that's a really good question. So the question is about um, what techniques would be used for player prediction. It's not something that um, we have focused on in my team, but there's um, several pieces of work that have come out over the last few years um, that show when and how it's useful to try to predict an opponent's behavior. Um, there's work by Roberta Railenu at um, NYU University. Um, that is one example, but there's a couple of works in this area. And um, if you catch me afterwards, I'd be happy to share some of the citations, some of the references there. Um, the key motivation is that um, we, when an agent interacts with a player or with an opponent in an environment, um, there's a question of how it can summarize the interaction history with this opponent in order to be able to um, get as much information about what might happen in the future. And their player modeling can introduce the right amount of structure that allows us to create quite reliable predictions, even when there might be different opponents or different collaborators that we interact with. And so it's a really um, interesting um, set of techniques that I'm very excited about and would love to see more in the future. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. Like very exciting talk and very um, enabling technology. Um, similar to how algorithms are running on reinforcement, humans do as well. Yeah. And I wonder how you are thinking about bringing them back into the loop, right? So you talked about player experience, but how do we actually get the feedback of the player back into um, the algorithms in that case? Mm -hmm. That's a fantastic question. I think we've barely scratched the, the surface of this. Um, one example is kind of having the player as a teacher more explicitly, like in the example of um, RL as a game mechanic that I showed earlier. Um, but I think it's a really open question of, um, for example, what kinds of reward signals we might um, use when we have RL characters that introduce with players. Um, there are lots of challenges. I'd love to hear more about the ideas that you might have, and maybe some ideas are already being explored here in the community. Thanks. So, a uh, very interesting uh, talk. Thank you. Thanks. Um, a question that goes a bit beyond this. Struck by what I'm seeing there, mine real life competition. Mine are uh, mine <laughs> yes, 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 yes. learning. So, <laughs> if you, if you want to move this kind of work, for example, to robots and stuff that interact mm -hmm. in real world, you run into the limit of not being able to have your robot run into lava a million times. Mm -hmm. um, are there any um, approaches exploring this? That in real life there's like real consequences to the, especially the negative rewards of reinforcement learning? Mm -hmm. Fantastic question. And as you mentioned, it does go a little bit beyond um, the scope of the talk here. There is a lot of work going on in reinforcement learning in the overall community. And I can only show a very, very small subset um, over here. There is a lot of interest in using those techniques um, for reinforcement learning, for example, in robotics and other real-world applications. And as you mentioned, this question of safety and real-world consequences is a very important one. Just some examples, um, people in the safety community 
university are, for example, looking at a challenge called sim to real So can you use millions of samples in a cheap simulator like um, the robotic simulator Mujoku that we briefly saw in order to pre-train models and then allow rapid transfer to real world situations? Ideally, we would like to get techniques that have some kind of guarantee so that we can, for example, give safety guarantees of what will happen. Um, at the same time, this is, this is a quickly moving area, so it's hard to predict what will be possible, but there are still key challenges that need to be addressed um, as, we, as we make this move. Another type of techniques in reinforcement learning um, is when we look at a subset of the reinforcement learning problem called the contextual bandit problem. So that's a slice of the RL problem that um, assumes that um, the actions that an agent takes don't have a very immediate effect on the states that it observes in the future. And that is, for example, a good model of how new users might arrive at a website and might see different news stories. And so, in fact, um, some techniques are already well understood. Um, some reinforcement learning um, techniques are well understood and are applied today, for example, to optimize recommendations on websites. So we see that there are techniques that are already very effective in those real world situations, but kind of taking the next steps towards um, agents that act in settings with high uncertainty, with very long term consequences, that is where we're pushing the current state of the art in RL. And I think that games can play a really important role there in order to allow us to learn uh, to develop more sample efficient techniques that are better understood and that eventually will give us some set of guarantees as we transition to other real world applications. And this transition is something that I'm also really excited about. I think there was another question here in the front. Um, hi, my name is Marie Gerald from Clemson University. I was noticing in your AI games that you had um, player controlled positive reinforcement items such as the diamonds. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if, at the risk of sounding a bit mean to our AI, <laughs> if you had ever, um, if there had been any research into like negative reinforcement items that a player controlled. So introducing something into the environment that the AI had been trained to dislike or have a negative reaction to? Mm, that's a really, really interesting question. And um, there is a wide um, set of literature that is exploring different ways of um, human in the loop reinforcement learning. Um, the work of um, Michael Littman and his group around uh, Coach, for example, is looking at a variety of positive and negative reinforcement learning or reinforcement that a player could provide in order to teach an agent. One thing we found is that for um, non-RL experts, it's typically hard to interpret and understand what consequences their use of positive or negative reinforcement, learn, uh, reinforcement will have on the behavior learned by the agent. So, for example, they may not provide either form of reward as um, co uh, consistently as would be expected by the RL algorithm. And so often this mismatch leads to kind of the agent learning unexpected behaviors. Um, this is one example that we found to be surprisingly robust, even though it's so simple. You place a couple of diamonds and the agent is able to continue to navigate through this. Um, whether we interpret this as positive or negative doesn't really matter too much to the algorithm per se, um, but there might be weird interactions. For example, how the expectations of the algorithm are initialized and then how, how the rewards we place deviate from that initial expectation. So while this one works well, there might be other types of kind of um, embodying reward in order to make it easier for people to actually predict the consequences of their reward that is placed there. And so really this question comes back to almost like the, the user interaction question of um, how can people place rewards that are meaningful, that allow them to predict how it's going to affect the agent's behavior, um, let alone the question of um, what does the agent actually need to, to learn from. Okay, so it's the time now, so I would close the round of questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, Katja. Okay. So, so now we'll be having our first break and also the first